Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, it is our great privilege to have Randy Jurgensen here to speak with us at our book club. Um, Randy is a former paratrooper and Green Beret who fought in Korea, where he was awarded three bronze stars and a purple heart for his service. Um, he also is a retired NYPD detective where he served for 16 years in Harlem. Um, he is also, interestingly, a movie producer and actor, and has appeared in films that many of you, I'm sure, have seen, including Donnie Brasco, Thinner, Homicide, uh, Fort Apache the Bronx, the Bronx uh, Superman, The French Connection, and I think perhaps the coolest fact about anyone I've ever met in my entire life, he is the person who, in The Godfather, shot and killed Sonny Corleone. Um, so the book that he is uh, here today to talk about is Circle of Six. This book is the story of the summer of 1972 in New York City, um, where a police officer was shot and oh, shot and killed um, in what is still an un unsolved crime. Uh, it sparked a riot in the city. Uh, the police responded after the shooting to a mosque in Harlem that was led by Louis Farrakhan. And according to the book, which Randy, I'm sure, will tell us about, the uh, murder and the events at the mosque will, were covered up. And this is a notorious and controversial case that this book details. Um, interestingly, Randy is here today uh, at the, uh, after the efforts of Kevin, uh, Kevin, our very own Kevin Hurley. And this is a very interesting fact. On the cover of this book, right here, this police officer, pushing up his glasses is Kevin Hurley's uncle, um, Jack Howe, who himself was an NYD, NYPD uh, police officer and inspector. He's a figure in this book. And, uh, and as a sign of respect for Kevin's uncle and his service to the NYPD, some of his former colleagues are here today to listen to Randy talk about the book, including uh, these are police officers who worked with and knew Inspector Howe, uh, retired police detective Don Camaretta, um, retired police Det lieutenant John Quinn and retired police uh, officer Tim Motto. Um, and uh, Detective Jurgensen is also joined here by his wife, Lynn, and his sisters, Evelyn and Misha Morrison. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Detective Jurgensen, and we look forward to hearing about the book. <clears throat> thank you for... Uh... <clears throat> giving me this opportunity to uh, speak to you uh, about this book. Um, 1972, uh, in the city of uh, New York, probably uh, it was the culmination of uh, um, crime, drugs, murder, um, <clears throat> the city was on the verge of uh, going broke. Um, the sanitation department had <clears throat> worked for two weeks uh, without pay, and finally uh, they went home. Um, <clears throat> we were experiencing uh, over 2,000 homicides uh, a year under Mayor uh, Koch, who was in office for eight years. Um, he was the mayor of, <clears throat> believe me, 20,000 murders, 20,000 homicides in the city of New York. <clears throat> we had registered uh, close to through arrests um, and people turning themselves in for help. We had close to 300,000 heroin users and addicts. Um, if you had a city with uh, that many people, let's say having tuberculosis, You'd be talking about quarantine. Um, <clears throat> we had a police department of uh, 34,000 uh, police officers. There are countries that don't have an army uh, of that size. Um, <clears throat> starting from the top down, um, in Washington, uh, we had a president that was uh, 
about to uh, be impeached, uh, uh, a president that was going to leave office. Um, <clears throat> We had uh, in the mayor of the city of New York, he had switched political parties and was now uh, throwing his hat into the Florida primary, uh, uh, going to take a run at being the president uh, for, the, for the presidency. That was Mayor John Lindsay. Um, Part of his campaign was that there were no riots, that the city, uh, you know, was a city that was oper uh, totally operating, uh, not like what happened in Watts, not like what happened in Chicago and in Philadelphia. No, that wasn't happening in, in his city. That was part of his uh, that was part of his platform. We had a police commissioner, in all honesty, that was interested in the length of our hair, uh, did we did we have the right um, uniform on? What did it look like? Um, absolutely, that's what it was. The difficulty, in spite of all of that, the homicides, the drugs, uh, uh, the demonstrations, the Columbia riots. <clears throat> in spite in spite of all of that, the police department was what was doing its job. The the biggest difficulty that we had to overcome was <clears throat> that we had people that make policy, people that were running uh, the, the police department, running the city. And this was the 60s. And we were doing this out of station houses that were built in the 30s. We had typewriters with carbon paper, Remingtons from the 40s. And this was the 60s, but the worst part was that these people, their heads were still in the 50s. Father knows best. This was not happening here. I mean, the drug epidemic, <clears throat> President Nixon uh, declared a war on drugs. I'm here to tell you, as you already know, we lost that war. Um, <clears throat> this is what it was like to be not a sanitation worker, not a fireman, but what it was to be a, a policeman. <clears throat> Let me tell you uh, about a policeman in 1971, 1972. That particular year, um, 13 police officers were executed. Now, <clears throat> is, that, is that different than a police officer who loses his life in a gun battle, in a bank stick up, or a candy store stick up, or whatever it is. I mean, the end result is the same. You're dead. However, how you get there, it does make a difference. It makes a huge difference. So by 1971 and 1972, police officers were actually being set up. They were being called to a certain location and triangularly fired upon. <clears throat> I never came across one of them, and I went to seven of them. I never came across one that wasn't shot at least seven times, eight times, nine times. Um, Piagentini and Jones, white and black. <clears throat> Foster and Laurie, white and black. Survived Vietnam to come home to get executed. Curry and Benetti, Irish and Italian. It made no difference. If you were in the blue uniform, you were a target. That's what it was like to be a police officer, or as we called ourselves, cops back then, <clears throat> patrolmen. That's what it was like to try and be in the city of New York. Now, there is a picture called... Um, <clears throat> the battle of or the battle for Algiers. And it seems that the uh, French paratroopers, would, elite, the best, uh, <clears throat> were in Algiers. Only they could not get a handle on it. They could not control it. It was totally, bombs were going off. Uh, it was all against the French paratroopers. And what, what they did was, <clears throat> What they did was they reinforced and built up the Algerian police department. They 
built up this police department. And the paratroopers relied upon the police department to control the Algerians, to control it, to, to, to stop the bombing and stuff like that. Well, the opening of this picture, there is a civilian and he's smoking a cigarette and he just calmly walks into, and it looks like a, a very small street. You don't see any traffic or anything like that. And there is a uniformed police officer standing there. And <clears throat> this Algerian <clears throat> walks up behind the policeman, puts a gun to the back of his head, and he pulls a trigger. Now that went on for 18 months in Algiers. And guess what? <clears throat> the police department collapsed. The French paratroopers, look at your history, went home. They won. The terrorists won. If they were terrorist groups or cells. Well, <clears throat> that picture was viewed over and over again by a group calling themselves the Black Liberation Army. And the Black Liberation Army was the group that was out executing these police officers. Um, San Francisco, two of them. St. Louis, four. Atlanta, three. <clears throat> During that period, 40 police officers were killed throughout the United States, but New York, uh, New York took the brunt of it. 13 from 1971 to 1972. Uh, and 40, exactly 40, were wounded or survived the shootings like Curry and Benetti. <clears throat> so you could see the goal here was to collapse the New York City Police Department. And I will tell you, as being there every day, responding to every one of these shootings, I could tell you <clears throat> it was, it was, it was scary. It was really scary. <clears throat> um, you talk about that thin blue line. Now, <clears throat> would there have been a Black Liberation Army if things, if things, let's let's say, if the establishment of this country had a, 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 was different at the particular time? Um, the establishment, as far as I'm concerned, when things got bad. <clears throat> It got bad in Harlem. It got bad in, 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 in the minority neighborhoods. The first ones to lose their jobs. Absolutely it was. They were at the bottom of the ladder. Uh, for me, what I witnessed uh, myself was that <clears throat> if there was any hope left, if there was any hope left, <clears throat> the day we killed Martin Luther King, Hope was gone, and it was replaced by anger. <clears throat> that riot went on for three days in Harlem. We actually ran out of ammunition. We ran out of ammunition. 1972 recorded 2,600 and shots fired in the city of New York. <clears throat> not in Beirut, not in Afghanistan, here in New York City. We were at war. We were definitely at war, and it was just not accepted. It was not tolerated. It was not being backed up. Uh, one of our answers was in 1968, uh, we in the city of New York were bringing back the electric chair for law and order. That's what we were bringing back to use. It hadn't been used since 1961, but in 1968, we brought it back. That was to control law and order. That's, that's how they thought that they were going to do this. So, <clears throat> and by 1974, if you talk about morale in the New York City Police Department, as the city went broke, believe it or not, 3,400 police officers were laid off in the city of New York. As I say, the city was going broke. I give you all of this because between all of that, and I promise you, between all of that stood me, Timmy Motto, John, 
That's all the city had. Today, you see the firemen. <clears throat> they all respond to a fire. They're all in an enclosed truck. Because back then, when the Bronx was burning, they would respond with their hook and ladder and so forth. And they got sniper fire. The firemen were actually uh, snipered upon. We used to have to, and I say we, I wasn't there as an individual. I'm speaking as a, as a policeman. We would have to escort the fire, the, the fire trucks to the scene of the fire and guard them so that they could put out the fire. That's what was going on in the city of New York. We would then uh, soon get, uh, get a, a president, and there's a play on words here, but he told the Bronx, literally, or the city of New York, President Ford, drop dead. Not giving you any money. Again, we were there. We absolutely were there. All of this was going on on April the 14th, 1972, when we got a call at 1013, that's a cop in trouble. <clears throat> and no matter what we're doing, we go. No matter what is going on, we go. <clears throat> I was, uh, I was, uh, I had a detail at that time, uh, five, uh, five of us, and we were, um, <clears throat> we were especially assigned uh, virtually, I don't want to say outside of the outside of the police department, but uh, we were assigned. I was personally appointed by the chief of detectives to head up this unit, and we were working on the Black Liberation Army. Um, <clears throat> we were working on people like uh, Joanne Chesimard, who we missed by four hours, who lives in Cuba today. She was wanted in the investigation of the killing of two cops, on which they threw a hand grenade and uh, the killing of a, 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 a Jersey cop. Uh, <clears throat> I was uh, set down um, on a stakeout on Twyman Myers, who uh, at 23 years of age uh, was wanted in the connection of the killing of uh, four cops and uh, performed the famous dance over one of the cops as they were, as they were going down. Um, I was set down on him with a team of five. Uh, five of us, and we were set down on 125th Street, and uh, we were waiting for him to come out, come out of the building. I had, I had arrested him 14, 15 months prior to, prior to that, him and a, and a female uh, in a shootout in the hallway, on which the cop that I was working with was Sonny Grasso, who was very, very famous for breaking the French Connection case. Uh, when we got Twyman Myers in the shootout, uh, Sonny got hurt, and that was the end of Sonny's career. Um, so, as I say, we were sitting down waiting for him, and he had managed to work his way that he was the number one criminal in the United States on the FBI's most wanted list when the, th when the 1013 came over that there was a cop in trouble. I broke the... Uh, <clears throat> I, I first sent half the detail because a lot of times when we were getting close to them, <clears throat> they would call in a 1013 knowing that we would all go and that was their escape out. I'm positive that's how Joanne slipped through our fingers. Um, so when this 1013 came over, I only sent half the unit, but within, within seconds, 30 seconds, 35 seconds, it came over, shots fired, and that's when I responded. <clears throat> and when I got there, I got to 116th Street, and I then realized that it was the mosque. I, 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 I was a seasoned detective, I was a second grade detective. I was on the job maybe 10 or 11 years. I was right around the corner from making first grade. Um, I were, and I was a homicide detective. Um, so when I got there and I realized the mask, I knew, I just knew in here, we were gonna have a bad day. This was not gonna go good. So <clears throat> I'd like to stop, stop here for a moment. And since I'm in front of a book club, I'd like to 
take a few minutes and just talk about the book before I get back to the uh, get back to the story. If I was talking to the if I was talking to the police, the policemen who <laughs> who shout out what should be done, what we should go and do. But I'm talking to a, a, a book club here. <clears throat> I was writing this book. I was writing this book for uh, 15 years. I, my wife will tell you, I was writing this book for 15 years after, <clears throat> after everything that happened. And there would be a year would go by, I would do nothing. And then all of a sudden it would be the, uh, the, the you know, the memorial of, of when it happened. Uh, something would get in the paper about it and I'd go back to writing the book. And I, and I wrote it longhand on yellow paper and so forth and so on. I had been uh, I have been party to uh, other books. There are uh, chapters. I I don't want to say solely about me, but I, and so I was part of part of those books, uh, magazine articles, and certainly in the newspapers. And, 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 and I I guess I know how it works. So <clears throat> about seven or eight years ago, maybe even nine years ago. There's an organization called the, uh, the New York State Shields. And <clears throat> the, one of the things that the State Shields do is they remember the families of all the police officers that are gone. And some of these, some of these are gone 10 years, 15 years. Some are gone one or two years. But they remember the families. So this year, it was being held aboard the Intrepid. And... Uh, one of the families that was invited was the Cardillo family, Phil Cardillo, who would lose his life at the mosque. His family was invited. By now, <clears throat> by now, uh, Phil's children had grown and they had children. And so I was taking that family up, the police commissioner was there, uh, and some other uh, dignitaries and I was escorting that family up <clears throat> just in front of that family I was uh, escorting another family by the name of uh, John Vareca and um, he lost his life uh, to the mob <clears throat> the mob the mob took him out this is not about that story but I, I have to take a moment <clears throat> uh, it was a shootout that I got involved in um, two mob guys, one a made man. And of course, the John came out second best, lost his life. And I was able to get them and we went to trial. And um, be before going to trial, uh, the FBI came in and they had uh, two recordings. And one recording was in, Ita in Italian, the other recording was in English, that there was uh, $50,000 and that I was going to be whacked. Uh, <clears throat> so I had that $50,000 uh, price, uh, price tag on my head. At that time, and during that time, I uh, knew uh, an FBI agent whose name was Joe Pistone, who I played basketball, uh, pa basketball against, and he would eventually become Danny Brasco. And we, have, we were friends then, we're friends now, our families and so forth and so on. So. <clears throat> That's what happened at at at, at that p particular at, at that particular trial. So on this day, I'm taking up that family of that deceased police officer, Vareka. Um, Joe Pistone is there, and Joe Pistone by this time has a half a million dollars placed on his head. So the security, unbeknownst to a lot of people that were there that day, was doubled because that was a perfect place to, to get both of us. As I'm going up now with the Cardillo family, I'm standing with Timmy Motto. And uh, Timmy Motto and I know the Cardillo family since, since it happened, since his children were three years of age. Well, <clears throat> they now have children. And what makes me finish the book is the following. Um, the grandson, who's about six or seven at the time, uh, he turns to Timmy and myself, and he said, "Was my was my grandfather was my grandfather a hero?" And Timmy and I, 
I don't even know where it came from. And I said, no, he was not a hero. He is a hero. And Joy Cardillo, the wife of the deceased cop, Phil Cardillo, turned to me and in front of the kids and said, Randy, when are you going to finish that goddamn book? And I went home and I finished that book. <clears throat> now, about the book. <clears throat> when, I started to, uh, when I started to write the book, it was quite clear that I needed a writer. And uh, I felt in, doing, in writing the book, I felt, I don't know why, but I felt I should get a journalist. I, I, I felt that's who, that's who should write the book. And I, I felt strong that it should be a female. I, I, I felt that, that that would have an entirely different male chauvinistic, let's go out and get them and kill. It would have a, a, a different feel to it. And I tried, um, I tried two, two different, um, will remain nameless, two different, uh, 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 and it didn't work. It, 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 it just didn't work. It, one of them was, <laughs> yeah, it just didn't work. <clears throat> And then uh, I came up with a, oh, my agent came up with a, uh, with a writer and <clears throat> his view was entirely different. It was entirely different. Um, you see, <clears throat> I've learned that there is a way to tell a story or to make a motion picture from the outside in. From the uh, outside in. It's an entirely different story if it's written from the inside out. If, if, if you are actually working on 42nd Street and what goes on and you write about that, it's different than an observer or a person that's looking at 42nd Street and what goes on from the outside. So one of the things that I was insisted upon that I was not going to write this book because all of the periodicals and the New York Times and uh, the, the Time magazine, and there are two other books, Target Blue, Murder at the Holland Mosque, they write in those books, they write in those books, they did this. They told the police to do that. They forbid the police to do that. I wasn't going to write about they. I wasn't going to write about they. Somebody other than they gave those orders. Somebody did that. And that took me quite a while to go back into newspapers, to go back into police files, which were made available to me. I went down to the police department, went into the storage areas, and I got the names. And I was going to put the names in the, in, in the book. Well, <clears throat> my publisher said, you'll never get this book written like that. It, it's not going to happen. I said, well, I'm not going to write the book unless that's not the way. So I came up with um, what I didn't want. I came up with a, uh, my agent came up with a police officer by the name of Rob Say. And what Rob Say had going for him was he wrote a book and it was called No Lights and No Sirens. And the book was doing quite well. So he was not like a first time author. He was a policeman. I didn't have to school him in anything. And we set off to write the book. And... Um, we wrote uh, one or two chapters, not exactly even in order, and we submitted them to the uh, publishing company. And I, on the front of the book, <clears throat> what I wrote was uh, setting the table. And that virtually is what I've discussed about what, what the city was like at that particular time. So <clears throat> we were turned down by uh, three publishing companies and uh, a publishing company by the name of Disinformation decided to take a chance. Even on the names, they would take, they would take a chance. So <clears throat> we set out to uh, write the book. The biggest thing that Disinformation would say to me, how are we going to market this other than it going into Barnes & Noble under true crime? You know, who's your audience? How, how, do, how do we, how, how, how are we going to, who are you going to, who's going to buy this book? I said to them, I said, well, you know, I, I, I could reassure you that there are thousands of police officers that are retired, police officers that are presently on the job. This case, if it's not famous, it's infamous. 
This case will not go away. I'm sure that they will buy this book. Well, with that, we set out to do it. Now, <clears throat> a few things I'd like to tell you about the book was um, it was going to be a hardcover book. Now, this book, the hardcover, came out six years ago. And at the time, <clears throat> uh, Gary Badley, who was my publisher of this information, he gave me a history in hardcover books. Hardcover books on an average, now we're not talking about romance novels or Patterson or Clancy before he passed away. Uh, we're talking about the average hardcover book. That sells just 700 copies. That's the average of what it sells, 700 copies. It's always at a loss. Why do you do it? Well, the New York Times, the LA Times, any of the newspapers that count, they will not review or give their blessing to a paperback. So we all go for hardcover. Now, <clears throat> um, our book and disinformation here, this is a little backstory. Our book here, a disinformation, the New York Times, it reviewed it and it gave a good review. And that was the first time in, the, in disinformation's history that they had ever had a, a New York Times review. So with that, boy, that, that started the book to go. Now, <clears throat> the book was edited. Uh, we went through uh, hours and hours. And the main thing is, is that the uh, legal department of the publishing company uh, gave their blessing to the six names that I accuse of, uh, of not doing their job. Um, and they give it. As of today, which is, the book is out six years, the paperback is out three years, we've never been sued. They've not touched us. When it, when it came to doing the hardcover book, since it was something that we were looking back on, and I have something to do with movies other than just watching them, uh, I, I felt that the cover should be sepia. It should be like this sepia college, a, a little burnt orange, because if you look at a movie, that's going to talk about the 30s, the 20s, or whatever it is. If it's going to be in color, it's really not technicolor. When you're looking back, it's it's that kind of a it's that kind of an orangey, uh, orangey uh, color, and I wanted it to be grainy. <clears throat> when it came out to be the paperback, which you have in front of you, um, I went for uh, police department blue, uh, the blue color of the of the of the police department, and variations of that. Um, I'm a detective. Uh, well, I have a gold shield, so I wanted gold on the gold on the book. It, it didn't print well, so they used a yellow, and that is supposed to be uh, for the gold. <clears throat> As of today, um, the hardcover has um, exceeded seven thousand sales. The uh, the paperback, which is out three years, uh, come September of this year. Uh, it will go into a uh, second printing. The book has done very well. The last thing that I'll say about the book is that my first, uh, one of my first speaking engagements, other than Barnes and Noble, uh, was to um, the PBA, which is the organization of the city of New York. And I spoke in front of the, uh, the, the, uh, the PBA and um, within an hour, uh, <clears throat> They bought 660 hardcover books. Um, <clears throat> I went to, um, there's an organization called the IPA, the International Police Association. Uh, um, they had their convention or their meeting in uh, Las Vegas. I went to Las Vegas and um, there were policemen there from Hawaii, um, Texas, Ar Ar Arkansas, uh, Miami, uh, Boston, Chicago, but they were also there from New Zealand, Australia, England, and Ireland. Um, I, I, I don't remember Italy, but they, they, I, I sold immediately on the first day 300 books with a, a big share of those books going to Australia, England, which I've heard back on, the, on my website and the email. So the book has, the book is gone from Hawaii to Europe, uh, as far as I know. 
Um, and I'm also, uh, I, I'm also quite, I'm also quite proud of the, uh, I, I, I'm quite, quite proud of the, uh, of the book. Now, <clears throat> April 14th, 1972, it was a Friday, it was noon. I, I, I've said to you, uh, you know, the 1013, I've given you the atmosphere of what was going on. The commander of the 28th precinct, which is the smallest precinct in the city of New York, was uh, Jack Howe. And um, uh, Jack Howe was, you hear this term all the time, Jack Howe was a cop's cop. By that, Jack Howe could tell you virtually th the first names of the cops that were working for him. Believe me, that, that is not the case. It's not the case at all. If, if anybody tells you that the uh, sergeants run, run the police department, it's a fact. It's the sergeants that are out there. Jack Howe was out there. And Jack Howe came there as a captain and did such a job in that precinct, the smallest precinct in the city of New York, first in, uh, first in not to be proud of, but first in rapes, for, uh, definitely first in homicides. We would have 121 homicides a year I'm not being cold, but we would bet Fort Apache, which was three times our size, we would bet those detectives, we would have more homicides than them, a Peter Luger steak dinner, and we collected it every year. They, did, they could not come close to the homicides that we had. That's what Jack Howe was in charge of. Um, we had virtually no rookies. You were no rookies uh, uh, in, in the 2-8. Uh, we virtually had no basically walking policemen uh, within the 2-8. Uh, the 2-8 uh, took the brunt of the, uh, uh, took the brunt of the, the, the killing of uh, Martin Luther King as far as, you know, the fires and the disruptions. And believe me, I was there as a cop and we understood it. We understood it. Do you know what on that night? Nobody was arrested. Nobody was arrested. The following morning, we started to make arrests then when the looting really be began to go, but nobody was arrested. We understood. <clears throat> so as I say, Jack Howe was the commander. So uh, when I got to, and by the way, the 2-8 also leads in cops shot. Um, <clears throat> our wall up in the 2-8, we paid the price. Um, <clears throat> so when I got there, one of the first persons that I saw on the scene was Jack Howe. Now, Jack Howe's the commander. It's Jack Howe's cops that are being hurt. It's Jack Howe's cops that are there that are, that are inside the mosque. So when I got there, I saw him. And he said to me, he said, Randy, do you have this? Meaning, I'm a detective. Is this your case? And I said, no, it's not my case. And I said, you know, what, what's going on? You know, he said, uh, they have people down in the basement. He said, they, they've taken a couple, uh, a couple of uh, police officers uh, up to the hospital. He said, and he told me, to a shot, he says, and there are guns missing. I said, okay. And I, I started into the mosque. And when I went into the mosque, the first thing that I saw was blood all over the walls, right in the vestibule. I saw the blood, um, <clears throat> you know, it was too late probably to establish a crime scene at this time. And you could see what the desk was turned over. So I went to the top of the stairs and I started down and I met another police officer that I know on a first name basis, Rudy Andre, who was there. And as I went down, Rudy said, I fired my gun. I was shot. We've got people down in the wall. I said, OK. I said, OK. You got I said, no, I don't have this. Are the detectives here? He says, yes, they are. And I turned around. I never saw the people against the wall. I turned around. I went upstairs. And when I went upstairs, <clears throat> I looked at the situation. And the situation was that the mosque was entirely ringed in by police officers. Remember, this is not our first shooting. This is not the first time a cop. These guys are seasoned veterans at this. So the mosque was ringed in. Nobody in, nobody out. Now, I am of no use there. I, there's nothing for me to do. The answer lies at the hospital, not for a cop, but for a detective. 
And so I started to go over to the hospital when I saw, you know, the man that was typically came out of central casting, my boss, the chief of detectives, Al Seedman. Cigar hat, I mean, he was the chief of detectives. He, he ran, when I saw him, <clears throat> uh, what do you got? And I said, I'm not sure, but the detectives are downstairs. I'm on my way to the hospital where the cops are. He nodded and kept right on walking. So I went over to the hospital. When I got to the hospital, it was a triage. I'm not going to go into that. My, my dad worked there. And <clears throat> it, it, was, it, it was a triage. Um, they were lined up. Curtains were pulled. Uh, cops were there. Uh, nurses, doctors. But it was not chaotic like the movies will show you. Racing and running. Not like that at all. <clears throat> I opened up the first one, and I saw the uh, uh, the cop from uh, your command, uh, <clears throat> Padilla, and uh, Padilla was convulsing, and they were trying to hold him down. Uh, <clears throat> Padilla would lose uh, thirty percent sight in one eye, the ribs, the concussion, and he was he was con convulsing. In the next one was his partner, Ivan Negron, and Negron was saying to me, "I don't know how he to this day." I never met him. I don't know how he knew my first name. Randy, they got his gun. Randy, they got his gun. So I knew that there was a gun missing back there. And he was in worse shape. He was bleeding from every place. Um, <clears throat> and I went into the third one. And my dad was with me. And I said, Dad, uh, I, go, I don't want you here. I went into the third one. And I saw Vito Navarra. And Vito Navarra <clears throat> is like a big teddy bear. He was hunched over. He was crying. His eye was closed. One tooth was gone. His ankle would later prove to be uh, chipped or whatever it is. And he said to me, he said, Randy, it's Phil. It's Phil. And I said to him, I, never, I said, Vito, this hospital here, St. Luke's, they have a reputation of never losing a police officer. It's going to be okay. And he just kept saying, Randy, it's Phil. Randy, it's Phil. A little backstory, a little backstory. Can you imagine that the New York City Police Department decided to give him as my partner when I got the case to go and investigate this? I was working with a basket case. You don't do that. They did it. <clears throat> So I said, Vito, come with me. You can come back with me. The nurse was saying, he can't leave. I said, Vito, come back with me. You can ID these guys. They got them in the basement. And he said, yes. <clears throat> we took a towel, not the huge towel, soaking wet the towel. And I, we wrapped it around him. The nurse did help us. And we went limping out. And as we were going out, as we were going out, I came into a room the size of this. There was the mayor of the city of New York. There was the police commissioner. And there was the deputy commissioner, Robert Daly. Robert Daly, um, Robert, Robert Daly was public information, a very important uh, figure within the police department. And uh, Robert and Robert Daly's father was a, a, a well-renowned uh, writer for the Journal American uh, newspaper. That's who Robert Daly was. And Robert Daly would eventually write a book called Target Blue, and it was about, about this case. So as I was going over, as I was leaving with Vito, and I saw this, and my dad was there, and they were setting it up or whatever it was, the police commissioner actually called me over, called me, Detective Jurgensen. I left Vito in a chair, and I went over, and um, what's your assessment? Now it's like an audience, the mayor, Daly, I didn't even know who the other official people were. What's your assessment of, of what's going on on 16th Street? I said, well, <clears throat> we got some, I, I noticed some missing guns. I, I said, there's a police officer shot here. I said, and you know, and, and, and the street, the, the street is erupting, you know. To, and the police commissioner out loud said, there's no riot there. And I said, uh, I never said that. Uh, he's, no, there's, there's no riot there. And then he turns to the, 
He turns to the mayor and he says, no, there's no riot there. I've been in touch with the people at 116th Street. Everything is under control. I didn't realize how tall uh, Lindsay was, you know. I'm 6'1". Lindsay was bigger than me. And I, uh, I was, I walked away and I grabbed Vito. And I got in my car and we went back. Now, here's where it's become, it, here's where from here on in, it's become the darkest day in the history of the New York City Police Department. <clears throat> when I got back there with Vito, the streets were gone. Forget about it. Uh, cars were turned over, including my car. Uh, they were set on fire. I mean, it was just going. The Muslims had nothing to do with this. They had nothing to do with this. And as I got closer, and there was Jack Howe, as I got closer, the Muslims now ring the mosque. The, the police officers weren't there. They, they ring the mosque. I, I, I couldn't figure out what was really what was going on. So when I got to the door, um, the, the, uh, <clears throat> it's a very militant mosque. And they have what they call the FOI, the Fruit of Islam. And they're soldiers. And these were standing on the door. And I was going in with Vito, and he said to me, you, you can't come in here. And I said, oh, yes, I am. I said, I'm coming in here. I'm, I'm a police officer, and I'm coming in here. And he said, no, you're not. Once again, I said, I'm going to arrest you right here on the spot. I am coming in. You're impeding an investigation, this, that, and everything else. And he turned to me, and he said, well, he can come in, but you can't. I'm going to get Vito in there. That's all I need. I can't identify anybody, and it wasn't that I backed down. I decided this was the fight I was not going to have at this time, and I said, Vito, go ahead. And as Vito went in, I saw other people, Muslims, standing on the crime scene, standing all in the crime scene. Vito went in. I told Vito, look for Seedman, who's my boss, go downstairs. Well, Vito went downstairs. I then headed for Jack Howe. And I'm going to ask Jack Howe what really happened. And at this time, as I say, this day will never be forgotten. <clears throat> Benjamin Ward stood on the truck of an emergency service vehicle over a bullhorn and said, all white cops leave the area. Only black cops stay. I misunderstood it because I turned to one of the cops and I said, what's a block cop? I don't know what a block. No, it's not a block cop. It's you're only go that's who's going to stay. Return to your command. Well, <clears throat> there was a there was a uh, there was a unit there from the 32nd precinct where uh, both in uniform and one was black and one was white. And the, the white cop was not leaving. He was, he was not leaving his part, part uh, he was not leaving his partner. He, he was going to stay. Oh, <clears throat> I took my unit and which consisted of, uh, uh, one, 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 uh, one hero, trust me, one hero, <clears throat> Jerry. Uh, I took, I took, and I said, we're leaving. And he looked at me and I said, you're leaving with me. It left in that situation. And I've not left out anything. It left 12 cops. It left the people in the basement trapped. There was no way to get in, and it was no way to get them out. Now, what happened in the basement was Congressman Rangel came and said to the chief of detectives, you have to leave this building. You must leave this building immediately. Seidman refused. The congressman reminds Seidman who he was, and you have to leave. Seidman refused. <clears throat> Minister Louis Farrakhan came over to Seidman and told him, I can't guarantee your safety. Now, the mosque was swollen with FOI soldiers. They were in there. They were going to protect the mosque. There were children in the mosque upstairs. There were. Shots had been fired in the building. They, it took me a lot of years 
to realize this, that it, they didn't want guns in the mosque. They didn't want the people, the cops in the mosque. They wanted them out. Minister Louis Farrakhan, again, couldn't guarantee Seidman wouldn't go. Seidman then was ordered out by Benjamin Ward, who was the highest ranking person uh, within the police department that was on site. He was telling Jack Howe what to do with his troops. It's almost unheard of. <clears throat> we are back then and probably going to be more so today, we are a semi-military organization. In 1972, the people that were basically up, up running the job, other than the mayor and the police commissioner, remember the police commissioner is not a cop, uh, uh, up, up running the job. I mean, these guys were from the Second World War. Um, by 1972, uh, I'm a Korean veteran. There were, I could t there were a lot of Korean veterans. And certainly by 1972, we had a lot of Vietnam veterans. <clears throat> As I say, we are a semi-military organization. An order given is an order obeyed. And so when that order was given to leave, we left. I left. I, I took my team with me. On my radio came my first name, Randy, 1011. This is Inspector Howe. It was Jack Howe. Uh, 1011 is a meet. Meet me. He gave me the address of where to meet. I made my way with my team back through the people. And I, I, I came to him and he said, Randy, you have to clear the roofs. Look what's happening. The bricks were coming off. The, there was a bus trapped with people on it. Uh, it was just sheer chaos. It was somebody was going to be killed. Somebody was going to be killed. At that point, Jack Howe was looking out for the community, not the police officers. It was the community. He said, it was almost like in military, can you take that roof and can you, can you clear it? And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. <clears throat> I took my team and we went up to the roof. Now, as we were going to the roof, we were being followed. We were being followed by angry, angry people. <clears throat> As we went up to each stair, I left the cop, two guns out, so that we could make the next one. Then he would back up. We would be there, hold him back up. And that's how we made our way up to the roof. We got to the roof. There was no way to lock the door. So at the top of the stairs, Jerry <clears throat> stayed with two guns out. Now, I was on a detail that was hunting, if you will, the Black Liberation Army. The Black Liberation Army had one AK-47. They had uh, two uh, uh, semi-automatic carbines. They had the best, the best guns that you could possibly think of. There were no Saturday night specials that were being used uh, against the cops. So <clears throat> in order to uh, make the playing field legal, uh, I took a department uh, shotgun. Yes, I did. I, I sawed it down so that it would only be this big so I could, I could conceal it. Uh, uh, D'Alessio had a, a semi-automatic uh, uh, carbine and, um, and um, Ray San Pedro, uh, he had a carbine and two, and, and two guns, uh, but his carbine would only fire one shot at a time. So we made the roof. And as I made the roof, a helicopter swooped down. It was almost like eye level. And I kept waving my shield, waving my shield. And I kept reminding myself that I was in the city of New York, not in Beirut. And I, I was showing him the shield and he acknowledged like that, the, du the dust and the dirt. Up went the helicopter and we cleared the roof. Once we cleared the roof, the streets were lost. There was no danger of anybody coming out into the streets. It was just chaotic. The door opens up and in comes 35X uh, Kenyatta dressed in a dashiki with crossed swords and a, and a commander, an, a, 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 a commander, a very high commander within the police department. Who are you? What's your detail? What are you doing here? You disobeyed orders. We're charging you with disobeying orders. You're not supposed to be here. 
And I said, <clears throat> what well, we were ordered here. And he said, well, we're going to search you. And that was my first, that was it. I, I crossed, I said, no, you're not. I, you're not going to search me. I said, I'll open up my coats. <clears throat> and we opened up, we opened up our coats and they took our weapons. They took our, they took our weapons. I broke the shotgun down, but I kept one piece of, just one piece of the shotgun. And they took it. And as fast as they came up and did that, they walked away. By now, if you are us, by now, this side, this whole side of the roof, the other side of the roof, right up into the door, is swollen with people. Swollen with people. There's no way, there's no way we're going to get off this roof. Told my, follow me. <clears throat> we cut through. And we were going all the way down the stairs, down the stairs. And there was a well. And we were going down the stairs. We could see each other. We were going down. We were going down. And all I prayed was that nobody would sneeze. Not even anything. And we were going, sure enough, when we got to the bottom, somebody threw a can and it hit one of the people there. And that was the end of it. That, that was it. <clears throat> By the time we got into the street, they had Jerry down on the ground. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't going well. And we went to the guns and started firing the guns in the air. We got to the police car, and um, I, we, we couldn't get it started. They, they crashed the window, threw the lit rags in. It was. As I came out, and the guns, we were still firing the guns. I hadn't. Uh, as I came out, I got struck, and at the same time, the gun was, and I knew I was shot. Now, <clears throat> the first person that's picking me up off the floor is Jack Howe. And they dragged me over, and they're putting me on the bus, and I know I'm shot. And <clears throat> they put me on the bus, and now the bus can't move. Jerry, Harvey is his last name, goes to the front of the bus, pulls the bus driver over, off the bus, gets behind the wheel, drives up on the sidewalk, takes the newsstand out, took a portable telephone booth out, and went straight across the street, and, and that's how we got to the hospital. Now, I've been very descriptive in, 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 in telling you really what has happened here. Um, <clears throat> what, has, what has happened here, it was, you know, the beginning of the end of the police department as we knew the police department. It definitely, this was the beginning of the end. As the cop lay uh, in the hospital dying, our police commissioner came out through the New York Times and publicly apologized for our behavior. While I was in the hospital uh, for three days, I was taken off my detail and my detail was disbanded. I was being investigated as to the shotgun, whether it was legal or illegal while I was in the hospital and it was legal. <clears throat> On the third day, when I heard that Phil Cardillo was going to die, I got up and decided I wasn't going to be there when he died. We were never visited by the police commissioner or anybody, except I was visited by Jack Howe. And Jack Howe said to me, I hate to ask you this. And I cut him off. And I said, it's, I had heard it. I said, the gun is legal. And he said, I thought it was, Randy. I said, the, the gun is legal. I said, but they've got me on disobeying orders. He says, there's really not much that I can do about that, but I will, blah, 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 blah. Okay. <clears throat> Phil dies, and this is the living end. <clears throat> there's a tradition in the police department. It was carried on through 9-11, where our mayor actually had a helicopter from Staten Island to Long Island to make the funeral of all of the cops. And he made every one of them. A 175 year tradition on that day, April the 14th, was broken. Actually, it was like on the 21st or the 22nd when they buried Phil Cardillo, neither the mayor or the police commissioner showed up. They did not, that was the end. I'm not going to go on to any more about the investigation. I lived two years with the eyewitness. I mean, you know all that. What I would like to spend a couple of minutes with is the end result. 
And the end result of that is that one day, someday, it always winds up in a courtroom or it winds up in a grand jury. I can imagine that most of you are attorneys and you can, you can recognize, the, recognize the process. Well, <clears throat> when I got the eyewitness, of course, I ran right to the grand jury and I indicted, uh, I indicted Louis 17X Dupree for the murder. Took me a while later, I went and got the dead cop's handcuffs and I put those handcuffs on Louis Dupree and I locked them up. Now we're gonna go to trial. Jim Harmon is the ADA, excellent. John Cannon, who's today a huge, big federal judge, is the head of the homicide division. Um, <clears throat> and John Van Lent, uh, John Van Lent is also there. I, I know there is somebody here, Peter, uh, you know these people. Uh, okay, and Morgenthor, Morgenthor is now the man. Morgenthor, and he's the man. And so we're gonna to go to trial. Now, after all is said and done, after countless, countless hours of me wearing a wire, getting the Muslims down there, doing whatever, Harmon exactly has this. Harmon has an eyewitness that I got, that I lived with for two years. During that two years, he impregnated his girlfriend. There's now a ch child there. He also, uh, he also receives a stipend. By the time that they put me on the stand, I, I was virtually accused of being a pimp. Uh, you know, I, I, I coerced him. I did this. There was no, that was Harmon's case. He had an eyewitness, a very good one, a very good, young, clean Muslim who had a good position uh, within the mosque. He had him and he had myself. And virtually, he didn't have anything else. He didn't have ballistics. He didn't have photo. He didn't have a crime scene. He didn't have statements. They never took statements months after the case of the police officers that were there. He had none of that to go with. And to boot, there seemed to be an undercover FBI uh, group that was going on that I'm not gonna go, uh, I'm not gonna go into. Uh, there is an investigative reporter here who's done a whirlwind job here, Michael Morrison. He will explain to you and I think it reaches to the White House, but he will explain it to you. And, and so when Harmon found that out, we did our best. I did my best. I went back. He was now Donnie Brasco. I went back and I tried to, who are these FBI? Who were they that came and interviewed Dupree? Who was, they came and interviewed Hope. They were showing him pictures. And Harmon says, the FBI keeps good records. Randy, go find those records. I couldn't. And we went to trial. <clears throat> the defense attorneys uh, had just finished up, I believe, the zebra killings in San Francisco. And they were well financed by, uh, by the, the Muslim nations. Um, there had been, uh, from Yemen and Syria, there had been low-level complaints to the UN uh, about invasion of the mosque. So <clears throat> that's what Harmon had to go with. At the time, the trial was the longest, most expensive trial there was uh, in the city of uh, New York. And the best we got was 10 to 2. Total and complete hung jury. 10 to 2. 10 voting guilty, one woman voting not guilty, and one woman not voting. She wouldn't vote because she didn't want this one woman to be standing, standing alone. The judge accepted it, um, and finally it was a hung jury. It was just a formality by the time we went to the uh, second trial. And we went to the second trial. And of course, Louis, uh, Louis Dupree was found uh, not guilty. And so it's 40 years later. And here we stand in the hit modern history of the New York City Police Department, the only cop that was killed. And there is no conviction. Thank you for listening. <clears throat> um, I, I, I will take some questions uh, if, if you want, but 
let me have uh, Michael Morrison uh, put the uh, put the cap on this. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Randy. I'll be very quick. Um, uh, the fellow who did the first introduction really told you what a great guy Randy is and, and stole all my best lines, so I'm not going to reintroduce Randy. Uh, I'm an investigative reporter. I'm the chief investigative reporter for a government watchdog group called Judicial Watch in Washington, D.C. Before that, I was an investigative consultant for Fox News for many years, and before that, I led the investigative team of the Wall Street Journal uh, editorial page. I think when you, when you look at this case, there are three key questions. One, Randy mentioned the mysterious 1013 officer in distress call. That was never solved. Who made that call? Who, in effect, lured these police officers to the mob? Secondly, that Randy glossed over it a little bit. Um, Typically, and we've gone back and, and, and really nailed this down, t all the time, the Nation of Islam mosques had guards on the door. The Fruit of Islam would always be guarding the doors. When Cardillo and his colleagues responded uh, to the 1013 call, there were no guards on the doors. So the two unanswered questions, and the reason many of us keep coming back to this case, is one, who made the 1013 call? And two, who took the guards off the door? If we could answer those questions, we might get some finality to this uh, case. The third thing, which Randy sort of got into briefly, is um, the FBI was really very deeply involved in this case. And many of us think, and there is some evidence now, uh, that uh, there are uh, informant records and electronic surveillance records of the FBI, uh, which they have not provided to journalists, to the NYPD, and others. Randy was, and if we could get those records, again, we might have some answers. Uh, Randy was quite modest. After the book came out, uh, there was a, a police commissioner named Ray Kelly. When Ray Kelly was a young man, a young officer, he was on guard duty uh, at St. Luke's when Phil Cardillo died. So he took a personal interest in this case. After Randy's book came out, uh, Ray Kelly, being the police commissioner, met with Randy, and the eventual result was that they, a new major case squad investigation was reopened seven years ago. That major case squad investigation by the NYPD is still ongoing, and we have some idea what they're doing, and folks who follow this are not, not too pleased. According to one uh, document that we've obtained, uh, in the case, the NYPD wrote to the major case, wrote to the FBI saying, quote, there's evidence of a conspiracy to kill Cardillo, and that's why we've reopened the investigation. Well, I don't think anybody believes that Phil Cardillo himself was targeted or lured to that uh, mosque, but perhaps folks were trying to cause some sort of altercation. Was it folks in the mosque who wanted to draw the police there, create an event, and then profit from that. There's another possibility that we're looking into, and that is the FBI's own involvement. This happened in 1972. As I'm sure everybody in this room knows, uh, the FBI was deeply involved in targeting of domestic dissidents, uh, dissidents both uh, uh, radical and violent and people entirely peaceful, uh, like the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Martin Luther King, on to the Black Panthers and the, the BLA, the Black Liberation Army. Um, and they targeted through a, a illegal operation called COINTELPRO. And COINTELPRO was exposed in May of 1971 and supposedly shut down. Now, COINTELPRO, there are a lot of documents that have been made available. And we know, we can prove that COINTELPRO targeted the Nation of Islam, uh, targeted uh, uh, other groups, and uh, monitored the mosque where this incident took place. The documents the FBI provides us and provided the NYPD Major Case Squad with, which we've had a look at, uh, stop about four months before the killing of Phil Cardillo. So the question is, what was going on and what does the FBI have? The other thing that I'll leave you with is that recently there's been exposed another uh, FBI operation. So COINTELPRO, you have to ask, well, why would they cover it up for, for 40 years? Well, uh, 
COINTELPRO was shut down in May of 1971. Phil Cardillo was killed in April of 1972. There was still a lot of uh, uh, controversy around all this at that time. So the FBI would not want made public an operation that was supposed to have been shut down a year ago, uh, a year earlier. So that's one reason why we think COINTELPRO might figure into this. We know as well now that that Nixon and Hoover uh, personally were deeply alarmed by the assassination of police officers in the country, and they launched a second uh, secret operation called Operation New Kill. A New Kill has been discussed a little bit in the press. It's been uh, exposed, and we actually have, thanks to Nixon taping himself, uh, which of course led to his uh, resignation, um, we have a uh, fascinating conversation between Nixon and Hoover. It's a matter of public record, and we have it as well in our investigative files, uh, where where Nixon and Hoover are discussing the uh, the assassination of Piacentini and Jones about four months before uh, Phil Cardillo is killed, or maybe six months before. And Nixon says to Hoover, go all out. Do everything you can to get these guys. Well, you know, with J. Edgar Hoover, who's sort of in the twilight of his career and maybe, you know, being a little reckless already, uh, uh, that's basically a license to go out and hunt and kill. And Hoover talks to the NYPD, and Hoover says to the NYPD, I only have one condition here. My condition is I'm going to I'm going to help you and we're going to go hunt the BLA uh, and anybody we think associated with the BLA. Uh, and my one condition is, is that this operation be kept completely secret, because if it's not kept completely secret, every police department in the country is going to be coming to the FBI for help. So they said, uh, the NYPD agreed, we will keep this completely secret. And uh, the point of contact the only point of contact on this will be Al Seedman, who Randy talked about, who was also running the uh, Cardillo investigation. So due to those facts and other documents that we've obtained, uh, we believe that the FBI has uh, uh, informant records and electronic surveillance records related to this case, which may uh, uh, turn up new evidence and, in fact, um, uh, solve it one day. So again, the three key questions for us would be, who made the 1013 call? Who took the Fruit of Islam guards off the door? And what information does the FBI have in their files that they're not releasing? Thank you.